Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is February 10, year 2022, and it is 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I welcome you all here in the live chat. I congratulate you and I thank you for your intrepidness and in following me to this channel. Most of you know that I was given a time out by two of you, but I'll be back hopefully by uh, next Tuesday, because I had a one-week uh, suspension. Doesn't matter. This material here is going to be recorded for posterity. It's also my first draft for my own published work. It's, uh, of course, my contention that it is the printed word that will outlast uh, anything uh, that will appear on YouTube. So um, I really am grateful that you're here to share with me some of these uh, great finds that I've made for over the past week now, it's it's been evolving over the past few weeks since I started reading the Ian Fleming novels. But this morning, just this very morning, it all came down to a fine point. <laughs> and I still fully, honestly, have not assimilated some of the finds that I made today. But it does confirm my suspicion that there was much more to Ian Fleming and the 007 and the James Bond figure. I mean, anybody can tell you that, right? But I'm going into specifics. I have read, as of today, all 13. I thought it was 12, but then I realized. And fortunately, the 13th novel is only 160 pages long. So I was able to read that starting yesterday, and I finished it up this morning. Um, and then I have one one or two more books to read. One, one is a collection of short stories, which might may yield some more gems. And then there's a book as part of this reissue series on what he calls uh, Thrilling Cities, Ian Fleming, 13 different cities around the world. He was an inveterate traveler. And, um, of course, a lot of his uh, note taking and his research, and he was a researcher. Make no doubt of this is before Wikipedia and the days before you can just go online and get all this information, which is typically presented today as disconnected, right? Without any sort of context at all, he was able to, contrary to that, go to these places and uh, use some sh shoe leather in order to gather cultural information. Plus, he as I mentioned before, this, this past Tuesday, more specifically, he also had the the help of a, prob a lot of newspaper people, journalists, who were doubling as intelligence assets, as he was. He was a newspaper man himself. And uh, I mentioned this in passing because those people who keep whining about CNN and Brian Setzer and or, or some PR person like Jen Psaki. These people don't really matter. This is, it's all part of the larger intelligence network, right? So these conservative people who think they know what they're, they're you know, they're onto something. Oh yeah, CNN's a, yeah, come on, grow up, forget about it. Dig a little bit more deep, more deeply and you'll be much more, uh, find it a much more rewarding experience. The other stuff is laziness, just making fun and uh, name calling. That's just lazy concern. That's Ben Shapiro talk. That's Bongino. Uh, fortunately, Alex Jones is seeming to be moving away from it slightly, although he still likes to uh, refer to the chat comms as if that explains anything, right? Well, I will um, go in today deeply into institution today in 2022, that is far more of a threat to the human race than the Chakoms or the Russians or whoever else it is. Um, and it's this financial system that views most of you and me, most of humanity, as, as you know, the phrase useless eaters, right? Uh, that's not idle chit chat. And don't tune out just because you've heard the phrase before and you think you know everything there is to know, Margaret Sanger, you don't. And I don't either, right? You only know what you read on some website that's repeated the same information over and over again. And I'm proud to say, I'll tell you again, unless it hasn't really sunk into your mind, I focus on 
original work. Yes, I'm on YouTube, the home of the biters, the home of the plagiarists, the home of the weasels who pass off information as their own. That's my medium. Yes, I'm here. But for those of you who are newbies who do not know my work, be patient, but not with me, but with yourself. Do not be too quick to foreclose new information. That is the bane of new insights, of new, of blazing new trails. That is the biggest problem, not censorship, not censorship. We can get around censorship. The biggest problem is people who come to the party who think that they are the life of the party and they know everything else is going to go down. All right. I'm sorry for starting out with a rant. I'll try to husband my strength here, but it's uh, very, it's it's irritating, as you might imagine. And I also want to tell the, the people who think they know it all and the nitpickers to find some under, go to a channel. It's a real good one. I'm being sarcastic. It's Todd Grande. You know, he's got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. He's supposedly a psychotherapist or something who, who knows all the scoops on all these different personalities. And uh, you'll never see him be put in a timeout by YouTube. He's probably a YouTube creation for all I know. I, I wouldn't put it past him. Anyway, as I was getting prepared, as I'm coming down from my temper tantrum, I was uh, prepping by listening to Hoagie Carmichael. And this is not just some gratuitous name check exercise here. I bring this up because Ian Fleming himself, when asked who, what does 007 look like? Because we only have your words. He said he looks very similar to Hoagie Carmichael. And Hoagie Carmichael, you know, I guess he was, he was probably a very ordinary looking person, hugely talented, minus songwriter, stardust, right? Uh, you know, Georgia, right? Georgia on my mind. Lazy River, Rock and Share is a good one. Uh, I like Skylark. That's one of my favorites. It's part of the American standard, the American song. But anyways, he was the guy that, um, this is a good album, by the way. It's uh, arranged and conducted by Johnny Mandel, one of the great uh, popular American, uh, arrangers of popular American music. I think he did some arrangements for Frank Sinatra, all the big, big ones, based in L.A., Los Angeles. And for all you L.A. haters, blah, 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 yip, yip, what, what, Laurel Canyon, Dave McGowan, whatever, you know, just shove it because LA is a cultural capital for se several decades now. For uh, over 100 years, it's been producing some incredible work from cinema to music and uh, today even to new media. Now, once we, we, you and me, the ordinary people, win back the media, and we're, we're doing it right now, and I'm, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do it later, um, Los Angeles will undergo a revival. San Francisco will undergo a revival. The whole great state of California will undergo a revival. It's not going to come from the elective officials. Of course, it's going to come from the culture, from the popular culture. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. And then I also listened a little bit to this soundtrack from a great independent film, independent film called uh, The Harder They Come. This is uh, mostly Jimmy Cliffs on this album. He's one of the big, probably second only in name recognition to uh, Bob Marley. And there, again, this is not just some gratuitous name check. Jamaica, as you know, looms large in the life and the profession and the influence, the long term down to today, influence of Jamaica in the New World Order, right? And I'll get to the reason why, because, you know, people talk about Dave McGowan and, the, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sick of you people leaving comments about Dave McGowan. All right. Who, who was like a Jamie uh, or Annie Jacobson? He was a composite author, right? He was an author who took all these little folders and compiled them in order to uh, defame the 1960s. I guess you're still threatened by him. I don't know. You, maybe you should be because um, it was a pivotal decade that keeps on giving so far as the culture and the politics, right? You may have killed all our martyrs, Martin Luther King Jr., Robert Kennedy, John F. Kennedy Jr., but you never can um, killed their 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 influence, their ideas, their ideology, their uh, influences, cultural. Well, however, if you want to, if, even if you don't like these people on an individual level, epigenetically they live 
on, and they were very much part of the 60s. Epigenetically, and I know you tried to experiment, and I'm talking about certain groups, power groups, that we'll be at least alluding to today. You may have tried to extinguish uh, the Irish people and the Scots and um, the Welsh, and you might have um, had some success uh, at it, and you might have been responsible for, for forcing their mass evacuation, their escape to North America, to places in in the African continent, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. You might have had success in sending all your prisoners over there or running them out of the country. But just like our martyred heroes from the 1960s, their ideas, their spirit, and their politics, their intellectual and cultural legacy, let's not forget the culture, right, lives on. And we see it with the trucker rebellion up in Canada. Both, most of those people there are multi-generational descendants of what I'm calling the Celtic diaspora. All right, diaspora. They said, well, you know, Ireland's a small country. Uh, Scotland is a small country, you know, which means that it's not significant, right? Large does not mean bigger, right? <laughs> I mean, it's got a small population now because it was depopulated. But if you take all these people together on a diasporic level, you see that they constitute a huge political power block. And that's something that the people in... Uh, Davos, Switzerland did not anticipate because they still look at countries as nation states that can be bought out, you know, give them money through their pass-throughs like George Soros or assassinate their leadership or give them curricula coming down for the United Nations and put some slick name on it like GLBTQ studies or performance studies or uh, critical race theory. You know, you just pay a bunch of professors off to and, and buy publishing houses to publish only that type of book. You can do that, right? And perhaps take over certain nation states, certain countries. But if you take my concept, and this is all part of my new world order theory, right? Um, if you un take Take if you understand these these groups, right? These diasporas, as I call them, as a pan or trans supranational political force, then you're in a lot of trouble because you did not really talk to me. <laughs> you know, you should, instead of firing me, you should have brought me in and debriefed me, not my underpants briefs, because I know that's how you sway. You know, you, you swing that way, but you're not going to get into my shorts, right? And that's another reason why you, you, you fired me, because I was not part of that team. You know what I mean? The diddle team, the bugger team. Um, but if you listen to me, you'd be, you'd be able to pull off your little scheme that uh, you thought was going to be executed courtesy of one of my ex-colleagues, Dr. Robert Malone and uh, all these other characters who now are turning tail, you know, and say, oh, no, no, no I, I was on your side, boss. I was on your, no, no, you got me all wrong. I, I'm not, I'm not the problem. I'm, I'm helping you. And of course, most of these uh, jerkwads who can't really think at any level of uh, sophistication, say, you know, like your Ben Shapiro's or whoever. Oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a huge uh, breakthrough here to get these people, you know, as if they were responsible for persuading them to see the light and to come over into the forces of, of good instead of evil. No, it's because they're trying to save their butts, right? The people who are, who are defecting. And, and there's more and more of them all the time. And we welcome them, okay? We welcome them, but we're not going to forget. We're not going to forget. Anyway, I'm not, it's not today's talk, but I have to make a clean breast of it before I move on. So uh, as I stated in the previous talk, I'm studying Ian Fleming as a form of counter counter intelligence, right, to figure out how we're going to survive the new world order. And what better way to get an index into British intelligence and the Anglo-American British intelligence network by doing it through their popular fiction. Because as I've stated before, what's going on with Fleming is that he's doing a heterodyne type effect. He's sending out one superficial signal, let's say, or one popular culture type 
image of the James Bond and the exploding cars and the beautiful women and uh, you, you know the whole bit and the exotic locations and the great food. You know, he's giving us the Austin Powers deal, right? It's all fun and games. It's so trivial. Okay, but on that, on the heterodyne, there's another signal, and that's the signal of the of the real new world order. That is the signal of this global political economic empire that most ass clowns today still think resides in the U.S. Federal Reserve or they think it has a physical location in the city of London or Wall Street. They could be conservative. They could be leftist. Everybody hates Wall Street. Everybody hates the city of London. Sure, sure. Yeah, hate, hate all you want. They love that. Uh, at the same time, while you are going after those particular eggs, the weasel has already come into the hen house and sucked the egg, all the essence out of the egg. And so you're sitting on an egg that's been that's been molested by the weasels. They've already absconded with it. It's in Panama. It's in Jamaica. And where was the golden eye? Right, the Amphalos, right? The eye, the eye of Horus. Ooh, yeah. Why don't you put that down in your little book about how everything is occulted, right? I'm tired of you guys. You're part of the problem. You don't know anything. Uh, it might have been news. It might have been great when uh, people were, were making these kind of connections about 40 or 50 years ago. But, but this is 2022, and humanity was tottering on the brink of extinction while you were talking about the Illuminati and the Freemasons. Woo! Okay. Um, speaking of Freemasons, you may understand why if someone like me uh, has any authority, cultural, political, or even human authority because you know i've taught courses in american studies and they said well gee you're not american how can you teach american studies well you don't know history that's part of your problem right so let me establish once and for all my position professor hamamoto daryl yoshito hamamoto i have a japanese middle name that's part of our tradition to remind us where our bloodlines are okay we also have a very strong tradition and nuclear bombs or uh, Fukushima or anything else that that's not going to really be able to kill it epigenetically, just like you were not able to kill the Irish race or the Scots or the Welsh. You're not going to be able to 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 pull this off because epigenetically the knowledge, the wisdom, it's passed on. It comes through. Um, but. Just to finish up this line of um, of argumentation, let's say the reason why I'm in connected to the Freemasonic and the Scottish uh, secret society, Scottish rite uh, history is because, and this is on another. You might have to search for it. I'm going to have to put it on my playlist here. But I, you know, a couple of years ago, I did a whole piece on the role of a Scottish. There you go, and why Scots are important here because they're the bankers. Right. Everybody thinks it's the uh, Hazarians or Judaics who are the bankers. No, it's the Scots, it's the Dutch. And and sure, certainly they had uh, court Jews or Judenhofer, like the Rockefellers, the Rockefellers, whoever that were part of that. But I'm talking about these early uh, entities, banking entities that helped shape the modern world down to, to 2022. Anyway, there was a Scotsman. His name is Thomas Blake Glover. Check out that piece I did on him who was a member of the Scottish Rite. He was a a, a trade, uh, a merchant, right? A banker, right? And remember, we're going to talk about the Knights Templar, not in depth, because you think you know everything there is about uh, Knights Templar because you saw some stuff on YouTube. So we're not going to go very deep into it. And I have tons of books, tons of old published books that go back into the mid part of the 19th century uh, before they were taken off the university uh, bookshelves. Uh, and even then, I don't claim any uh, expert uh, knowledge of this, but I'm just telling you this to not to not to tune out, not mentally tune out, not to be distracted by what you think you have under your belt so far as the uh, homework is concerned. And this is not homework. This is this is a uh, a calling. It's a higher vocation. Right. Anyway, Glover was all of this. And uh, where did he go? Just like his predecessors, they had been trying for the previous 300 years. Where did he go to make some wealth? Because Scotland back then was a fairly poor country 
purposely made so by the people down in the southern part of the island, right? Those people who they vanquished, right? Uh, nonetheless, they have an intellectual tradition. We know it as the Scottish Enlightenment. And they had they were blessed with the seaports and the shipbuilding technology. And um, they knew how to fish and they knew how to fight and they knew how to think and they knew how to plan. And so they one of their uh, guys, uh, Thomas Blake Glover, as a teenager, hired on to a ship and he worked his way up through the ranks. And eventually he he became, because um, he's a brilliant fellow, an enterprising chap who went to Japan and said, hey, I'm going to my fortune here. And how am I going to do that? Well, you know, opium, sure. That's, by the way, it wasn't illegal back then, right? And neither was the importation of rifles, right? And uh, firearms in general. And that's how Thomas Blake Glover uh, got into Japan by ingratiating himself to the local daimyo or the shogunate and said, we're going to give you these rivals and you're going to give me certain money here and you're going to be able to wipe out every other year rivals there. And just, you know, I'm really giving you the abbreviated version there. And that worked fairly well. Everybody benefited except the people on the losing end. And the point I'm making is so what happened is that something called the Meiji revolution took place or the restoration they put the emperor back on the throne and the entire islands of japan there's five main ones was consolidated into a unified centralized power thanks to uh, thomas glover who was uh, uh or you can blame him however you want to put it as his freemason by the way there's a freemasonic lodge in tokyo and uh, freemasonry is alive and well in japan and freemasonry is alive and well throughout uh, most of, of Asia, including East Asia, China, Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Macau, and uh, I don't know about in India. I don't know about the, the mainland. I don't know about China. Uh, some of you can check that out. But the point is, is that Freemasonry is not strictly a European, not strictly a Latin American, because we know Simon Bolivar and other individuals were, were Freemasons. It's truly a global network, a political economic network with, with heavy, strong philosophical, metaphysical traditions that that uh, back it up. And uh, those all, all you nouveau riche here who think you're making a bunch of money off us by putting us through this crisis, that's not going to last long for you. It's going to last one generation most because you know why? You don't have a philosophical, metaphysical background grounding and in philosophy and thought and uh, religion, if you want to put it more in a practical sense, all you did was able to abscond with, with my money out of the pension fund or taxpayers or whatever scams, or you were a contractor, military contractor, and um, you got someone like uh, Gordon Chang or uh, some, some of these other people who you see on the conservative talk show circuit saying, yeah, the Chacoms are a danger, danger, yeah, so... Yeah, put through that two billion dollar uh, fund for on the part of the rhinos. Put it through Congress and give all the money to the contractors. Right, right. Your wealth is not going to last beyond one generation because you lack the philosophical, the metaphysical grounding. Because you think that the money itself is going to uh, bring you power, uh, and it's not. So in fact, it's going to come back to bite you on the butt. I'm just telling you that now for all the pharmaceutical the people who've made tons of money that own stock in the pharmaceuticals and uh, the uh, Monsanto and the Bayer and and all the other, all the institutions that are that are buying these uh, and all those people are buying up the music copyrights. It's not going to last very long. For one thing, your kids are going to come back turn around. They're going to kill you. <laughs> And uh, by the way, as I as I alluded to before, I think that's how um, Ian Fleming himself met an early death at age fifty six. Because uh, as I told you, his estate today, even back when he was alive, it was already raking, raking in the dough. And I think he wanted to hold on to it, or at least have some control over some say so. And they said, "Well, okay, you've, you've written thirteen books. It's time for you to split." So he's out too. But he's more complex than that. So hang on. I got tons of information on one Ian Fleming. So anyway, as you know, he has a Scots background. James Bond reveals himself. This comes later. I didn't read. That's why I had to read the whole whole series. Because it doesn't show up until about book 
10 or 11, you know, towards the end, where we find out who James Bond, where he comes from, right? And this is from the book uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. This, the whole plot rests upon finding a, a noble lineage for this guy, Blofield. He wants to be, he's known as Blofield. He wants to be called Blo, Bloville. So James Bond presents himself as a genealogical expert to find this supposed connection to nobility. And it's the snobbery that gets Blofield. He escapes in this book, but... James Bond eventually strangles him to death, right? That's why when I say you're, you people, you nouveaux, you nouveau riche, whoever you're, you might be from India. You know, you might be the CEO of, of Twitter or something, one of the Silicon Valley uh, techno coolies, or you're from China. You're from the, and you, you know, you, you're really good in engineering, you know, or maybe you're Priscilla Chan. You married Zuck, right? You think all that money's going to stick with you? No, it's not going to, it's not going to stick. All right. So surrender, Dorothy. Surrender. Well, you're not Dorothy. You're more like the Wicked Witch of the East, Priscilla Chang, the philanthropist, right? Whose uh, father, by the way, was a, uh, according to my sources, was a high-level criminal. All right, I'm going to leave it at that for now. Maybe that's that's time for another, for another talk, right? Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm presenting, not because I'm fascinated about uh, Ian Fleming or 007 uh, in and of itself, although I, I, I have to admit I'm really digging this type of research. And thank you very much for my supporters for funding me. I was able to buy each one of these, every single one of these books. And I'll let me show off and at the same time, thank you, my Patreon supporters, for allowing me to buy this huge doorstop of a book. And that's good. I just got it yesterday. It's called Jane, uh, Ian Fleming's James Bond. Annotations and Chronologies for Ian Fleming's Bond series by John Griswold. John Griswold, I don't know if you're still with us, but you did a great job. It's updated, expanded. There's some illustrations. Gosh, it's a huge book. It runs over 400 pages, and it gives you some definitions, place names, geography, uh, definitions, and whatnot. It, and uh, I'm sure I'll be referring to to it uh, quite often, but it's great. And that just shows you the, the degree to which James Bond and Ian Fleming has captured the imagination of the general public as well as the specialized, um, even academic public, right? But they've never gone as far as Professor Hamamoto of cultural forensics has today. And I'll devote the last quarter of this talk today to the incredible find that uh, I was able to uh, uncover over the past 48 hours, let's call it. All right. I was going to talk about the remasculization of um, Anglo-American society. And I say Anglo-American because uh, most of Asia and Africa, and definitely most of the Arab world, never went queer, right? They never fell for the whole GLBTQ, Soros, Rockefeller, uh, United Nations, UNESCO, uh, British intelligence, Anglo-American intelligence, LBGT, LBGTQ agenda. We think every, the whole world's that way, but no, it's it's not. It's only a small minority of people. And we, we think it, the world's that way because it's, its uh, home is the university, right, where, where everybody has to take these courses, even if you're in chemistry or in, in some unrelated, seemingly unrelated, you have to pass through the GLBTQ grid. And why do I mention that? Because my argument is this, if we keep on this course of study that I'm presenting that talks about the epigenetic uh, and that there's a biological grounding in that, people in, in, this, in the biosciences can study, and they are, they are beginning to, and they're publishing in academic journals. If they, if they study, if they use what I'm giving out here for the past year, going on two years now, as a means of renewing the curriculum, K through 12, and through the university and through graduate study, and I'm not alone, we know about the University of Amsterdam, they have a chair, an endowed chair in Western esotericism, right? So I'm not alone here. I'm not a total pioneer. I'm just at the leading edge of it. 
if we foster that, this knowledge here that I'm giving on tube you, YouTube is not worthy of me. You're not, you don't deserve me. Gosh. But the people in the, in the live stream do deserve me. The people who are watching this record, you deserve me. So this is what I'm doing. I'm doing it for you, not for tube you. Tube you is just a tool for me. All right. It's a tube. And it's not going to tube me. It's not going to tube you. Um, but my point is, is that if we keep on this line of study, this, this line of inquiry, GLBTQ studies and its, its uh, successor or would-be successor, CRT, critical race theory, it's going to die of attrition. It's going to die. We won't have to do anything. So stop talking about CRT, this, and you know, Ben Shapiro, Don Bunge, you know, because that's an easy, it's an easy laugh, right? It's an easy uh, way to, to, to bring your audience to you because you you can dump on something that's such a, such a prime target, right? Jen Psaki, oh yeah, she's a stupid liar. Come on, let, let's, you're just feeding into to, to their world, right? But my point is that if we work a little bit harder and we enjoy these great books, these exciting books, we will be pushing out the bad. We'll be the good money. We'll be pushing out the bad money. We're going to reverse it. Usually it's the bad money pushing out the good money. <laughs> and it's not material. It's not guilt. It's not material money. It's psychic money. It's spiritual currency, right? It's intellectual currency is going to be pushing out the crap, the crap culture. And it's already starting to happen. And, um, I want to be at the forefront of that with your help. Thank you. Again, I can't thank you enough. I mean, you you followed me over to this channel after Tube. You thought they could put me on suspension. Too late, suckers, right? Go back to school. Zuckerberg, you dropped out of Harvard. You should have stayed there and studied the classics instead of trying to learn how to screw people over. Uh Okay, so I was going to talk about the remaster. I'll leave that for another. But the, uh, the good news is that Anglo-American society is remasculizing itself after the the big scare, the twenty-year scare called queer theory. That's what they they call it, queer theory. The twenty-year scare of theor, uh, scare of queer theory is about to end, and we're seeing it from our people up north, right? People of the Celtic diaspora, our truck drivers. I was remember I was hinting it. I was putting out the the frequencies uh, over a year ago when we were doing the Thursday trio, John O'Loughlin, George Webb, I was talking about, you know, the, the truckers um, devices called hardcore made in USA. This is checks your tire pressure for those big 18 wheelers. Yeah. It's really, it's really great for checking the tires, you know, and it doesn't really matter, you know, edged weapons, firearms, you are they going to outlaw these next? It's pretty hard to outlaw sticks and staffs. And by the way, there's a huge, as part of this remasculization uh, process, I note, um, and again, check out Tube U, there's a whole resurgence all across Europe, Western Europe, maybe Central Europe as well. Uh, they're getting in touch with their own martial tradition. The martial, we know about Bruce Lee and all that other stuff and and all the uh sort of debased iterations of that like kill bill one and kill bill two and mr miyagi and all that bullshit right but uh the real stuff is starting to resurface in uh in europe north to south from 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 italy all the way to the um scandinavian country they're looking at the old manuscripts they're looking at the old books they're translating it and they're they're um uh they're starting schools and uh they're learning this this is again the beauty of the popular culture and the epigenetic heritage that millions, hundreds of millions of people all around the world are beginning to rediscover right now in 2022. So it's not all bad news. Uh, you know, if you listen to the conservative um, news media alone, you're going to just sit around and eat your storable foods. Um, <laughs> what do you want to live like that? I mean, I have I have them, right? I have the storable food, but I'm not going to eat storable food. I'm going to eat uh, fresh grown organic uh, crops that, that, that I will raise or I will trade for. And um, that's how I'm going to live. You know, you could you could eat out of a out of a little uh, 
uh, MRE meals are ready to eat, but I'm not ready to go in that direction. That's good temporarily, but, but not for long term. All right. So, you know, about my, um, self-assignment, you know, that as of last Tuesday, I'm saying, yeah, we can look at city of London, wall street, but really you got to look at the Panama deception, the Panama papers, the Caribbean region. And one of the pioneers of that, that was kind of leading it out slowly through the popular cultures of the James Bond series. Ian Fleming himself. Okay. Now let me flesh out a little bit more of the connection of the of Golden Eye and Jamaica and the new locus of geopolitical uh political economic slavery or neo serfdom as it's being coordinated out of the Caribbean region, right? Grand take uh the well subsidiary island let's just just leave it at that all right i'm not going to get into the, the tall grass here but i found this book it's called the real james bonds uh the story of identity theft avian intrigue and ian fleming in uh, james bond is an author he's an expert in guess what caribbean birds uh and that was the story goes that james bond or ian fleming had that one of his books the real james bond's books on his shelf and say hey i'm going to name my hero James I, I think it was I think they knew each other I think they were put together and I think um the real James Bond was probably the avian expert that helped uh Ian Fleming provide the specifics the cultural the in this case the avian specifics to make his novels that much more uh rich and full of depth you know whether you're a specialist or not that's James Bond. But the point I'm making here is that I found from this book that's talking about the real James Bond, I found out that the Fleming estate, this is after James Bond was killed, or not James, Ian Fleming was killed or died. Let's just say he died, all right? The estate was left with a question, what are we going to do with Goldeneye? You know, we certainly don't want to live, even though all the royalty princess margaret and and people like uh well cultural figures actors i can't remember something they had, they had some pretty good parties and perhaps even sex orgies at golden eye what's going to happen to it now that our 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 man is gone right well it so happens that there was an one of these entrepreneurs not scottish i think he's an englishman his name's blackwell as in chris blackwell or Chris Blackwell, as we say in American English. He, you might know, and this is where Jimmy Cliff comes in, and Barb, Bob Marley and the Jamaican music scene comes in. Chris Blackwell was one of the British English entrepreneurs that helped put Jamaican music, or as we call it, reggae, onto the cultural map, to the civilizational map, it's impossible. You know, they have people in Tokyo who are totally, in, even now, into reggae and the, down to the dreadlocks, right? It's kind of weird seeing a Japanese person wearing dreads, but they got them there, right? Uh, just, just totally, just you know, just give me an illustration of how international this this music that comes from an island, small island, Jamaica, the great influencer. Do you think that happens by itself? Yes, the music is good, and Bob Marley was an incredible songwriter. So is Jimmy Cliff, and all the you know Toots and the Maytals, and all the different producers, the techniques that that came out of this small island area. But that's not sufficient. It requires someone to package that genius that music genius that cultural genius and that was chris blackwell's job just as brian epstein's job was to package working class liverpudlian scouse as it's called culture rock and roll american rock and roll bring it down to london and produce a group called the beatles and that doesn't take anything away from paul mccartney and Len lennon and george harrison and ringo being an incredible orchestral type uh, drama it doesn't take anything away from them but but on their own it's not going to happen you have to have someone to package it and bring it forward to the investors the bankers yes emi whoever else it may be are are going to have to be brought on board if you're going to create a cultural phenomenon in the uh, a synthetic cultural phenomenon uh in the age of uh, mass media global mass media and that was chris blackwell's function anyway let me i'm spending too much time on this where does Cla chris blackwell come in well the story goes that chris blackwell brought 
Bob Marley over to GoldenEye saying, hey, Bob, this is a great investment. Ian Fleming is dead. Why don't you buy it? And uh, supposedly, uh, Bob Marley said, no, I'm not interested. And so Chris Blackwell, the guy who showed him the GoldenEye estate, bought it. And so he's the owner of it. It's a 55-acre estate where you have to be filthy rich and wealthy in order to uh, go there unless you're one of the uh, servants. Maybe I'll try to get a job there as a dishwasher or as a Chinese cook. Uh, <laughs> I say Chinese because Chinese settled uh, Jamaica to a large extent. And I also mentioned China right now. It's appropriate time to talk about um, Ian Fleming's boner against Chinese people. There's a couple of times, three, three or four times where he talks about certain people. He's very much interested in race and, and racial admixtures. So this person's Russian. This person is a, a sadistic German. This person, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so he has a whole take on the Chinese people and the Japanese people. Uh, and Russians and all the national groups. And by the way, this all comes from his understanding of geopolitics, right? Uh, which was a new science of political control that was pioneered to a large degree uh, in Britain, was actually a German that, that uh, articulated it. Let me finish my story about Chris Blackwell. So then he he takes control or ownership of it, Island Records. And you know the story about Bob, Mar uh, Bob Marley, right? How he died. If you don't read the book by Alex Constantine, there's another book by uh, John Potash or Potash. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, who talk about how uh, Bob Marley himself was assassinated. It really gets me when I see these guitar sites and music sites. They have like 2 million subscribers and uh, they're talking about get back and they're, you know, name checking, uh, John Lennon's talking about what a genius he was, and they they don't even mention that he was assassinated. He was a victim of political assassination. Same way with um, uh, Bob Marley. And I won't go into specifics about that, but they moved him out of the way as well. He knew he was going to die. In fact, he'd been shot before. He'd recovered from his, his gunplay. And we were told back then that it was because of the drug uh, business, and we knew about ganja, right? Marijuana, we call it, and the drug trade. You know, that's easy to understand and all that. But what it, we didn't understand then, but we know now, is that it was uh, Anglo American intelligence that were behind the whole Rastafarian. They weren't behind the religion, but they were using the real sound familiar. They're using the religion as a way to push forward their own intelligence slash banking empire, Rastafari. And they also used, used Bob Marley and the reggae movement to put that gloss on this relocation of the global geopolitical recentering of the banking system into Jamaica and Panama and the Caribbean in general. Do you understand that? So maybe that's the reason why Dave McGowan picks the 60s and Laurel Canyon, which he never visited. He lived in LA. I've been to Laurel Canyon. I mean, I've driven through it. I didn't hang out with, with, with uh, David Crosby or, or uh, Graham Nash or Joni Mitchell or Frank Zappa, but I've been through the area, right? Maybe that's why he's focusing on it because it takes away the attention that the real book to be written about is about Jamaican reggae as being this synthetic cultural musical production that was there to disguise the relocation, or as it's called in, in political science, the deterritorialization. De de I'll say it again. Deterritorialization. De deterritorialization of the global banking system, right? No longer need bricks and uh, mortar. You've got computers. You've got high-speed computing on your side. And the market's open 24 hours a day. All right? So stop, you know, our friends in the conservative uh, realm, right? Let, you know, you keep talking about Fort Knox. There's no gold real. There's no gold in Fort Knox. And by the way, they, there was a plot line in that here in, in Ian Fleming, right? Of course, to take us our attention away from the fact that they were moving the gold, so to speak, to the Caribbean, not to Fort Knox, Kentucky, right? That was a plot line in, in one of the books, right? I think it was Goldfinger. Um, so stop talking about the Federal Reserve. I'll talk about it, but but you're that's old news. That's yesterday's news, and it's it's hurting us. It's preventing us from really getting 
to understand the new world order 2022, right? Not when the Federal Reserve was founded back in the early 20th century by J.B. Murray, you know, you know the story ad nauseum. I know it. I knew it years ago. But we got newbies coming in who keep doing the echo chamber effect here. All right. So I'm in the last quarter here. So I said, promise to myself, come hell or high water, I'm going to get into the Templar connection to Ian Fleming because I didn't want to... Uh, tease you with the headline here by not getting into it. And I might have to carry it over to next Tuesday. By the way, I think uh, Thursday of next week, our friend Manny Grossman is coming back for a visit and update on some new developments in his research, which is another, not, to me, it's another indication of how we are going to be driving out all this foundation fund, funded bogus fake syllabi that are being put into the colleges and universities. We're going to put undergraduates out on the street and, and solve problems, solve crimes, and research the, the community, go into the deep history, the fauna, the flora, the trees, the animal life, dig through the dirt. We're going to start K through 12. That's how we're going to take back education. We're not going to take back education by listening to uh, Ben Shapiro complain about all the liberals and, and the trade unions and the teachers. Forget them. We're not even going to have to deal with them. We're going to teach our kids how to live, how to be educated in the way it works. That's why I'm, I'm very much in support of Manny Grossman's uh, efforts. And I have a soft spot in my heart because he was also kicked out of the classroom just like I was. So we don't need your stinking classroom. We will do it on our own. Yes, sir. We don't need your stinking badges. Um, okay, I, I forgot to mention why um, Ian Fleming, before I go into his temp Templar background, I don't think he's a racist. Okay, this is not what I'm saying. I, the whole racism stuff, I mean, <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, boy. anyway, I'm not going to – I don't want to – going to bon, Bongino's territory, so I'm going to talk about it. But the reason that he was doing that, not because he was a racist, because he was making fun of this guy named uh, Leslie Charteris, not a guy, he's an author. Um, I don't think he was as, liter so far as literary skills are concerned, as gifted as Ian Fleming was, but he did come before Ian Fleming. He had his own spy who was kind of a robin hood type spy he was a good spy he was you know he had to kill people but he was a good guy he was likable like james bond and guess what his name was leslie charteris who was born yin by the way his father was a chinaman i'm using the old-fashioned term and also the acceptable term today and of course if if uh L.A. Marzulli and uh, Alex Jones can call people chai comms, which is like calling them a chink. Then I could use the word chi uh, Chinaman, right? But anyway, this guy was a uh, Chinaman or Chinese. His name is Yin. Leslie Chart, he, he anglicized his name, but his father was Chinese. And uh, as you know, the, the racial, the, the bloodlines is, is important, uh, especially back then as part of the British imperial mission. If you were uh, a racial hybrid, then you were less than uh, acceptable. Um, maybe the fact that uh, uh, Prince uh, Prince Edward or what, whatever, Prince Charlie or the guy that married the uh, partially uh, black uh, former actress, maybe that they're trying to send a signal there. I'm sure it's not out of love. It's There's some kind of political calculation involved with the Meghan Markle uh, marriage. I'm still trying to work that one out. I'm trying to figure that out. But the point is, is that this guy Charteris came up with a figure who was um, named the saint. The popular name was the saint. But guess what his name was? His name was Simon Templar. And one of the first books that this guy Charteris, Leslie Charteris wrote was the title was Knight Templar. So he, and he comes from intelligence, he comes from a very similar background, not, not a Scott, but Charteris, and he later migrate, emigrated to America. I think he became an American citizen and um, a, a, a mover and shaker in the movie business and television business as well. Because Roger Moore was in a series called The uh, the Saint before he became 007, I think. So there's a continuity. I think uh, Ian Fleming had a little bit of rivalry or competition with uh, Charteris, even though Charteris was 
he retired in 63 because I think Ian Fleming was brought in to take it, take the ball to the next uh, quarter, right? Take it forward. And of course, after they got rid of Fleming, they brought some, some other person in. Who, who it is, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. So anyway, so there's the Templar connection in, um, in fiction. Now, to wrap it up, and I was going to go in more into depth, but it's not necessary. By the way, I, I found out something. I have to say this. I found out something about Ivan T. Sanderson. Remember I told you last Tuesday that Ian Fleming was planning a trip to the U.S. They were going to meet someplace in New Jersey. I don't know why New Jersey. Maybe they're going to take a cab over to New York. But anyway, they were going to meet in, in um, the New Jersey, New York area, Ian Fleming, and a, a British and, again, an American, Anglo-American, right, figure by the name of Ivan T. Sanderson. Check back on last Tuesday's talk. And that's shortly before that trip. Uh, he he, he uh, died of um, probably cyanide gas poison. I'm talking about Ian Fleming. But as it turns out, I looked and said, who's okay? Who's this television personality, Ivan T. Sanderson? And sure enough, if you look on the retailer that ate the world, he's got all kinds of books there. He's about cryptozoology. And I gave a talk on Bernard Hoivelman's last year about crypto. He's the guy that coined the term cryptozoology, you know, Bigfoot and all these cryptids and all that. Uh, that's Bernard. And then um, Sanderson is associated with that. And I realized, oh, I recognize that name. And he wrote the introduction to this great book called Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to do Ivan T. Sanderson in some future talks, which I'm more than willing to do because I, I like that that metaphysical connection that I think the uh, nouveau riche lack. And that's why they're going to lose everything within one generation um, because they don't have any grounding, right? Where it really matters. And by the way, I mentioned that I keep mentioning this because Ian Fleming himself comes from wealth and he wanted to reject it. And this brings me to the close about the knighthood. He did not want the knighthood. At the end of um, the book, the man, this is the volume 13, the last novel of Ian Fleming before he died. At, at the end of The Man with the Golden Gun, M, who is his handler, as you know, puts him up for a knighthood. Now, James Bond already has the CMG, which stands for the Order of St. Michael, St. George. He's a companion, right? But he goes, uh, M wants to put him to the next level, make him a KCMG or a knight companion, the Order of St. Michael and St. George. So he goes to, and I'm wondering, you know, this is at the very end of the book, right? Where he's finally vanquished the sadistic archvillain, as he always does, almost always. Blofeld got away, and uh, his wife, Irma Bunt, got away a couple times, but he, he managed to kill them eventually. But he spends the last part, the last maybe even last chapter talking about why he doesn't want the knighthood because even though, and the prime minister said, yeah, we're going to put James because he does such a great job getting rid of this killer, this arch villain who wanted to destroy the world. Right. Uh, we're going to put him for knighthood. And then bond, uh, he sent a telegraph. He says to his new assistant, her name is um, Mary Goodnight. Right? And by the way, they get together. It's implied they get together on a Jamaican holiday in a remote area and uh, do their, because uh, um, Ian Fleming was heavily into sex. He was he heavily into orgies. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, um, Chris Blackwell is the illegitimate son of Ian Fleming. Ian Fleming had a long-term affair with one of his neighbors by Golden Eye, and the issue of that illicit affair was none other than Chris Blackwell, who later bought Golden Eye. See how it's all in the family? I told you before, it runs on two, two rails in the Anglo-American elite establishment. Buggery and bastardy, all right? Buggery and bastardy. And then there's a third hot rail. It's incest, right? Uh, that's the power rail. It's actually on two, two rails, and then there's the power rail, and the third is incest. So, I, yeah, I'm glad I remembered. Blackwell is the illegitimate bastard son of Ian Fleming. That's how we got Goldeneye, and that's how the reggae industry took off. 
And uh, Ian Fleming gives little indications of where it's going in back in 1964 with the man in the golden gun. So he turns down the knighthood. He turned, I mean, my gosh, the only other person that I know, only other two people I know and that you know of that turned down a knighthood or returned it are both dead. One is John Winston Lennon, who, as you remember, early days of the Beatles when they were still, right, the pop idols of the world and even British royalty, everybody was was getting into the London swings, uh, singles or swinging a London scene. And plus, uh, they, the Beatles almost single-handedly had wiped away this whole black and white dour post-war living on rations still poor. Uh, I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at their plight, but it turned from black and white to technicolor thanks to the Beatles. So they wanted to thank him more and they gave him members of the British empire. But John Winston L Lennon sent his back. He sent his, he, he wrote a snarky little note uh, attached to it. I, and I'm the reason I mentioned that, I think that had something to do with, with why he was allowed to be assassinated in uh, in New York. They don't forget that type of uh, slight. I'm talking about the uh, people who run the global banking system, right? Um, and the other person who turned down the night, who, does, who was a Beatle himself, is dead, and that's George Harrison. When he was still alive, they were going to elevate him in stage. He said, I don't want it. And then <laughs> you know what happened to him? Someone broke into his house and, and almost... Uh, well, he did stab him, but he he lived through it. But I don't. I think it hurt his health for the rest of his life, and then he died. Um, he was also a smoker, but I think the fact that his lungs were punctured and he was uh, that close to dying was um, might have been payback for the fact that he refused the knighthood. And um, as as you know, maybe Ian Fleming himself refused to be elevated. And so they said, well, you don't want to be part of the, of the club. We're inviting you, right? And you turn us down. No one turns us down. You're, you're gone, right? You're gone. We're taking it. And so the reason that now the question becomes then, if Ian Fleming slash James Bond, because this is Ian Fleming writing through Bond, why he doesn't doesn't want this type of distinction. You know, I want a private life and I just want to play it low key and I want to have to donate to charity and go to ribbon cuttings. I mean, you know, the usual type of um, uh, demurrals, I guess you would call them. Why? And but it didn't ring true with me. And I said, "Oh, I, I, I understand why Ian Fleming, why James Bond, who's a Scotsman now, and I'm claiming he comes from the bloodlines uh, that connect." Scotland with the um, the Knights Templar, you know, you know, Ross Lynch Apple, you know, if you read your Dan Brown and you think you've seen it all on YouTube. So I'm not going to go through there. You read read the actual books, right? The the texts and uh, to get really into it instead of just leaving it at the pop cultural level, because if you leave it at the pop cultural level, you will never gain insights like what I'm about to reveal to you right here. And right now, <laughs> do you like the way I'm building suspense? <laughs> I'm learning how to, how, to, how to do that through Ian Fleming. I'm seeing how he takes us from plot point to plot point to build, to release, to build, to build higher, right? There's a whole rhythm. It's very musical, right? I, I, can, I can understand what he was doing. And I know there's people in the comments who really hate it because uh, they think that because it's called the Professor Hamamoto channel, I'm supposed to come off like that gas bag, Jordan Peterson, and give you a lecture. I was, I've been lecturing for 40 years. I'm tired of lecturing. I hate lecturing. I, you should hate it too. It's just not a very effective way of uh, communicating. I like the more free flowing, uh, reverie, as uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau called it, reverie, reveries. I like reveries. I like uh, uh, jazz improvisation, right? And I'm going to be doing Miles Davis uh, shortly. So, all right. I've been teasing you long enough. The reason why Ian Fleming, the reason why James Bond, the Scotsman, Scotsman both. And remember, Templars, you're thinking of them knights. You're thinking of them as a military order, right? But remember, there were bankers, right? Bankers, Jamaica, the Panama Papers, 
man, again, I'm bringing it back to the Knights Templars were bankers. That's why they were put out of action. You know the whole story, right? Uh, Jacques de Molay, you know, all, all that. Friday the 13th, you know the whole mythology. The reason why Ian Fleming, the reason why James, and he puts his alter ego, um, put, M is also an alter ego. M, M doesn't like these types of distinctions either. He doesn't have to answer congratulatory letters, M, right? He's, he's above that because why? Because M, Ian Fleming, and James Bond are warrior monks. All of them are warrior monks. They've taken the vow of poverty, obedience, and chastity. <laughs> Bond did not. <laughs> But he did take the 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 vow of poverty. All these guys don't make much money. They keep they keep talking about how low how how they function on a real low budget, and they don't make a lot. Even M doesn't make very much. He lives off his his navy pension, his naval pension, Royal Navy, and whatever he's going to get after he retires from the uh, Secret Services. But they're all knights. They're all knights Templar, right? Call them Freemasons you want, but it goes it goes I think back into the Scottish. Bloodlines, and this is something where the crowdsourcing is going to help. I'll leave it up to you to do the genealogical research on Ian Fleming. By the way, in all these old articles I'm finding finding in books that were published back in the mid 19th century, the Fleming name comes up a lot when you're talking about Scottish Freemasonry. Right? I'm not saying it's Ian Fleming. I'm saying it's Richard Fleming, who's his father, who was the banker, right, who made the fortune. But I think. Richard Fleming, Ian Fleming's father, who was filthy rich, uh, was set up in the banking uh, banking business, right, in the city of London. He was set up by his Knights Templar Scottish Rite brothers, and that's Ian Fleming. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I haven't seen this hypothesis being put anywhere, but I'm doing it. There you go, because I've been studying the Scottish Rite Freemasonry as it relates to how they wanted to take over Japan and the rest of Asia, right? And they still haven't done it. They still have not accomplished it. They're trying to reach an accord, a concord right now. They're playing all these different power political, geopolitical games now using us as the pawns, and they're doing it through bioweaponry, which is very much two or three plot lines they're dealing with with bioweapons in the Fleming. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, something so trivial. I'm so glad I studied popular culture in 1976, Bowling Green State University, and stayed with it all my career. Because, ladies and gentlemen, in this exchange of information here, we could be taking back the American Republic and we could be saving the world. <laughs> yes. I am Blofeld in reverse. The super, I am Dr. No in reverse. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for putting up with me. I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm, I feel so good. I'm going to reward myself by going to my local Thai restaurant and ordering myself a steaming bowl of green curry. Oh, yeah. I'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye.